activist also in public office here in our community. And we're just so grateful that she's made the time and her very busy schedule to join us on this rainy but beautiful Sunday morning. The plants are very happy right now, as are God's creatures. Um, we're just going to give it another couple of minutes so folks can jump on this Zoom. But does anyone want to share some God moments that might have happened in the past week that you'd like to share with others? And it doesn't have to be super serious. It can just be fun or silly. Oh, well, heck, I'll jump in there. <laughs> All right, Kara, go for it. Oh, uh, yeah, you know. Um, well, hey, everybody, I'm Kara Fleischer, um, and I'm happy to be with you. My God moment was at creation at St. Paul's. We have had a vegetable garden for five years, but we just started focusing on our landscaping, um, adding some native plants. And the God moment was I was kind of on my own doing this because the vegetable garden folks just wanted a vegetable garden. Well, all of a sudden, we had a couple of people say, well, I like to landscape. And so our creation care team just grew by like a couple of people because they're super into landscaping. So I was like, I've been wanting to do this for so long and I didn't put it out there because I didn't know anybody else wanted to do it. So anyway, we had some new folks join us and we're redoing a whole area, um, making it into a pollinator garden and a sitting area. And so I thought that God brought me those folks right at the right time. Kara, that's awesome. You know. Um... One moment that I had that involved God's creation was I was sitting and talking with a member of the parish just for a pastoral conference. And I have a very nice picture window in my office. And this extremely rare bird landed on my windowsill. And I said, look at this beautiful bird. I mean, I've never seen one of these birds downtown. And so it was so beautiful. I had to actually take a picture of it with my phone and then post it to Facebook and say, Facebook help, I, all of you birders out there, this extremely rare bird, tell me what it is. And within like a second, people were like, um, Dave, that's a quail, you idiot. It's, <laughs> it's a Bob White quail, um, but a distinctly urbane Bob White quail came downtown. He str it was strutting, he had a little top hat on and tails. Um, so anyway, I was a little embarrassed, but it was a beautiful bird nonetheless. Um, so you didn't come here to hear me talking about birds. You came here to hear Kara talking about birds. But before she gets to do that, Dennis Howard is going to introduce her. Thank you so much, Dennis. Thank you, Father Dave. Uh, you know, for uh, Earth Day coming up, uh, I think for Kara, probably every day seems like Earth Day. Um, she's no stranger to St. John's. As Dave was saying earlier, her parents are our own very devoted par parishioners, uh, Fran and Phil Webb. And um, I saw on one of Kara's posts that she describes herself, and I, and I love this, she describes herself as a mom on a mission to talk about climate, to protect God's earth, and love on people. And she has walked the walk. As a member of uh, St. Paul's United Methodist Church, Kara helped uh, the church created a very vibrant and flourishing creation care ministry that she was just referring to. Uh, she's planted the seeds for and continues to nourish the Tallahassee Green Faith Alliance to bring people of all faiths together in our church, our, our city for climate and uh, creation care. She's elected as a, the supervisor of the Leon County Soil and Water Conservation District and I I think that Kara did that by uh, a no donation policy and uh, a minimal campaign, a recognition of her, her um, advocacy being known in the community. And finally, in recognition of her leadership in climate protection in 2019, she was selected as one of 23 creation care leaders worldwide as Christian observers of the UN's annual climate change conference in Madrid. Um, I don't want to talk too much longer, but I just did want to say that 
we know that the Episcopal Church uh, provides a covenant to care for God's creation and that many parishes across the U.S. have begun adopting programs. Uh, Kara's discussion today is going to help us understand how creation care programs and opportunities are cropping up right here in Tallahassee and how we might all labor together in God's vineyard. So Kara, it's all yours. Thank you and welcome. Gosh, thank you so much, Dennis. That was such a kind introduction and it has been such a joy to get to know you uh, through Tallahassee Green Faith Alliance. I'm grateful for your um, you know, you always show up, you always support everything that we do. And so it's been just such a neat um, opportunity for us to engage with other houses of worship. I think we have 25 now in the area and we are everyone from, um, you know, we have um, Islamic, Quakers, Catholics, um, Jewish. I mean, we're really, we're, we're covering the gamut, but we want more. So um, we're really excited that you guys are a part of that. So yes. Um, I'm Kara Fleischer, I'm from Tallahassee, and I'm just so thrilled to be with you today. I feel that St. John's is very close to my heart because my parents got married there, and um, my sweet mama's on the call right now. Good morning, <laughs> Fran. So um, just really happy to be with you and talk about this creation care ministry, which is such a joy for me to be able to dedicate my life to. I didn't know that this was my calling until five years ago. So just goes to show that you never know where God's going to lead you. But um, my, my quick story is, is that I grew up here, went to FSU, and then moved to Atlanta um, to work in public relations and communications. And um, my husband and I had our, our daughter. And when she was a baby, um, the day we brought her home from the hospital, we saw over the highway first time I really ever noticed, code purple smog alert, dangerous air, um, take precautions. And I had this infant in the car and I was like, well, what are you talking about? And so that really opened my eyes to air pollution. And unfortunately, the first year of her life, she did get breathing problems. She did have asthma. We had to do nebulizer treatments on an infant. It wasn't fun. Um, finally, after two years, her doctor really um, advised us to move back to Florida to get away from the smog because there's a lot of smog there. So we moved down to the Tampa St. Pete area and immediately got hit by four hurricanes, immediately. I said, I don't remember Florida being like this, but we lived close to the bay and our house was an old house. It wasn't even insured for the total amount that the house was worth. And so we just had so much stress on us so I started learning about why we were having so much stronger hurricanes and learned about climate change. Um, so we decided to move back to Tallahassee, um, loved it, thought that's a sweet, safe little town. We're not gonna have to worry about any of these problems. Come to find out my hometown is the capital of prescribed burning for the whole world. And so we have a burn season here of fall and spring. A lot of people, aren't really tuned into it, but because I already knew about air pollution, um, I was very tuned into it. And so that's when I said, okay, God, you're not gonna let me get away with not taking this on. And I decided to become a full-time pro bono environmental advocate to work on climate justice and air pollution. So I was, I was um, leading Citizens Climate Lobby and Moms Clean Air Force here in Tallahassee. And I was at church and I said, Wonder what our carbon footprint is. And so I asked our pastor and she said, oh, you mean creation care? And I said, I don't know what that is, but I love the sound of it. So turns out that creation care is where my faith and my values come together. And it really makes, um, it energizes me to be able to do this work. So thank you again for having me. And I'm going to go ahead and hop over to my presentation. Let's see. All right, are you seeing that? No, not yet. Okay, let me get back to the share screen. I really know how to do this, you guys. <laughs> it's Zoom. It is yeah. Zoom, it is Zoom. <laughs> there we go. Share screen, there we go. Share. Okay. Awesome. You got it. 
Got it. Okay, great. So I do have slides, but I hope not to dwell on them too long. Um, but I would love it if you would um, start off with a prayer with me. This is Pope Francis's prayer from Laudato Si, which is just so beautiful. So I'd like to share it. Um, if you would bow your heads with me. All powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace, that we may live as brothers and sisters harming no one. O God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth, so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives, that we may protect the world and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey toward your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. Amen. Thank you. So I told you about how I followed the call and here are two big reasons why my kids, Lauren and Kevin, a couple of years ago, um, they look a little different now, but um, I, once I learned everything that I did about climate change and air pollution, I knew that I had to work in this area to try to make, um, you know, the planet better for them, their future, and all kids. So today we're gonna to talk about why we need creation care, how God has equipped you, and will you act? This work is biblical and moral, and you can find it throughout the Bible where we are called to be good stewards of creation. And part of creation care is loving people. It's not just butterflies or animals or the oceans. It's loving people too. And so as we are called to love our neighbor, that means our neighbor next door, across the country and across the world, and also people who haven't even been born yet. And you have a wonderful example in Bishop Michael Curry. He is a leader in so many ways, and it's no surprise that he's also leading in this area of um, creation care. So he has a quote, um, we will join with other Christians and people of other faiths, all of whom care about the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the land in which we dwell. Now you have a wonderful resource in the Episcopal Climate News. And on the Episcopal Church website, there's a whole creation care section that has so much wonderful information. It really is impressive how much your denomination is acting in this area. So creation care is our biblical and moral call. And there's the Green Bible, which I love because in the Green Bible, any passage that has to do with creation or the earth or being good stewards of God's creation is written in green. So it really is amazing when you flip through it, how green the Bible actually is. As you probably know, the earth is at a tipping point and we need to act to reverse the damage that humans have caused really since the industrial industrial Revo revolution. In 150 years, it's shocking how far it has gone and how degraded the earth has become. The climate is already changed. We are seeing it in Florida. Florida is ground zero because we have severe weather like superstorms, droughts, wildfires, and floods. And 
I'm sure most of you lived here when Hurricane Michael came through and leveled Mexico Beach. I drove there a year later and did a story for the Democrat and took this photo. And it was so sad because a year later, it was still a war zone. And this banner had faded um, because that whole community was just devastated. Florida, like I said, has a lot to lose if we don't solve the problem. This is a map that was actually a very conservative estimate on what land would be lost if we don't act. And as you can see where we are in the panhandle, our beloved St. George Island and our coastal areas could very easily be gone. Not to mention the assets in Miami and Jacksonville and around the, the whole state. It's already flooding in Miami now, and they're putting millions and millions of dollars into raising roads, um, high tides now, um, even with the supermoon or without it, are causing all kinds of flooding where people can't even get to work and get to their cars. So climate justice, climate justice is the idea that the adverse impacts of warming, of a warming climate are not felt equitably among people. The poor, the vulnerable are the first to suffer. And we've seen that firsthand by what Michael did to the communities in Panama City. It wiped out low-income housing and created an enormous homeless population that is still struggling to this day. So low-income people, people of color, indigenous people, people with disabilities, older and very young, and women um, are hurt the worst, even though quite often they have the smallest carbon footprints. And I have a fantastic friend named Latricia Scriven, who is a pastor in Tallahassee at the New Life United Methodist Church. And I want to share her words about climate justice with you. So let me hop over to her really quickly. All right. Working on it, working on it. <laughs> Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Cara. So I'm going to jump right in. And I love to laugh, giggle, smile at all things. And I wish this was one of those moments. And yet it is not. Um, I recall feeling like as I was thinking about climate justice, it seems like it was yesterday although I was about five years young, when I remember walking into the living room and looking out of our sliding glass black door and literally squealing, mommy outside is on fire, right? Can you imagine there was red and orange flames all over the place, dark smoke seemed like it was rising to the heavens and the only thing my brain, right, at that age could comprehend was that the whole outside was on fire. What was actually happening is that one of the hundreds of gigantic petroleum filled drums that I passed by pretty much every single day had blown up near our neighborhood. It wasn't the first time, it wouldn't be the last time, but it caused mass evacuation from people who really could not afford to just be away from their homes at some unknown amount of time. I couldn't imagine what was happening because I was only five years old and I've heard it say, you know, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. But what do you say to a little girl who's standing outside and the entire kitchen is blowing up because people and power structures at the highest levels don't seem to want to make 
the right kinds of decisions. At that time, I didn't know then what I know now, and that is that I grew up on the cusp of what has become known as Cancer Alley. And that's an 85 mile stretch of land along the Mississippi River from Baton Rouge to New Orleans. And it has more petroleum plants than you can ever imagine or that should ever even be considered legal. But I guess that's what we get when we begin to have, I don't know, um, a society that values profits over people. We get Cancer Alley. And if you're me, not only do you get Cancer Alley, but you get a mom who was recently diagnosed with fourth stage ovarian cancer. You get her sister, my aunt, who was diagnosed with a fourth stage um, rare blood cancer, and they get three siblings who have all died of three different forms of cancer. There are eight of them all together. In ways that we know are connected directly to the environment, but can't absolutely prove and how many people would care anyway. And so now I'm no longer in Louisiana, right? I find myself in Florida. And some may say that's not our issue. That's Louisiana. Here we are in Florida. But as was just said, I um, am married to an amazing guy who's a dean and he's really handsome and cute. And he grew up, however, in Jacksonville, Florida, in between two housing projects. And as we've talked over the years, what I learned was that he played on a playground that he later found out was a toxic waste dump. And right across the street was an abandoned Chevron plant. So it's no wonder to me why his sister, my sister in love, was also diagnosed with cancer a few years ago. We are literally destroying the world and everyone in it and everything in it. And I think that until we make an informed decision to do otherwise, as long as we're making informed decisions to do nothing or very little, we are the ones that are responsible for setting an entire planet on fire. We've got to do better. We need to do better. We're here to demand, right, that we do better and that we transition to renewable energy and provide a safer place for all of us because we know that there are alternatives. And so we're calling for climate justice. And Pamela McVitie has said um, in an op-ed, we use the frame, the phrase climate justice because it embraces the principle that all people and communities are entitled to equal protection from the ravages of climate change. See, we know that in every major disaster, the most vulnerable people among us generally suffer the most because of where they live, because of limited resources and income and lack of access to healthcare. I mentioned earlier that my mom um, has fourth stage ovarian cancer. Usually I've been living in Louisiana now with her and I just come back and visit Tallahassee because I'm taking her to her chemo treatments. And most recently during the winter storm, it became so apparent to me who was affected by these unnatural disasters. We had to somehow make it, and we did through snow and sleet and all of these unnatural things. Finally got to the chemo treatment center where no one was available because the nurses could not get through the weather. When someone finally showed up, a room that's usually filled with about 15 people only had four because it spoke to who had the means to actually make it and who did not. Who had the means to stay an extra day because they couldn't go to the hospital for an additional treatment? And who could not? Who had to rely on public transportation and there was none? This was a direct result of what we are doing 
to the climate. So I agree with Pamela when she says things like, we are tired that the poorest people seem to lose their power first in disasters like these and the last to have them restored. We're tired that vendors in Miami have to work outdoors and are experiencing kidney damage because of the extreme heat. We're tired that African-Americans are almost 10 times more likely than whites to die from asthma that's made worse from higher temperatures. And we are sick and tired of being sick and tired that our children and our grandchildren and their children are being left a dangerous and unhealthy planet where toxic waste dumps become playgrounds and their backgrounds and backyards rather are literally being set on fire. We have the power to do more now. So why are we here today joining with people all over everywhere, all over the nation calling for climate justice and things to be done? I believe we're here because our faith compels us into action. I believe that some of us are here because we embrace this as God's creation and we want to be co-creators of a better future. I believe that many of us are here because we believe that this is what it means to love our neighbors, our siblings, our friends, and to care for the least of these. When we advocate for justice, I believe we're saying that Black Lives Matter. When we advocate for climate justice, I believe we're saying that Blue Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, Lives Matter, birds, trees, fish, seas, their lives matter. We are saying to the elementary children who are watching through the window outside what's happening, that your life matters. We're saying to the people who are dying in Cancer Alley, that we see you and your life matters. So that's it. We're here to demand to do better because we know that engaging in climate justice is honoring that what God did in the beginning continues through us today. That's all. Okay. I, I had to share that, that she just um, did that speech just a month ago when we had a local event called Ring the Bells for Climate Justice. And I had to take out my environmental justice slides in my presentation and just have Latricia tell her story. And I'm really, another God moment. Um, I've been working with Latricia just as I have Dennis for two years now, just kind of teaching her about creation care. And we did some joint projects together with our youth groups. And it has been unbelievable to see God working through her life to where it seems like every couple of months she learned something new about her own background. She didn't realize she even lived in Cancer Alley. She hadn't made the connection that her aunts all had cancer because of the pollution. And since that video, she's made the connection that her own son's um, birth defects can be directly caused related back to the pollution. So it is just, it gives me chills. I love her so much. So let me go back to my presentation. Thank you for allowing me to show that. Okay, it looks like I got way behind. Let's see. Sorry, hang on a sec. Where were we? Here we are. Okay. There we go. Okay, so we have such an opportunity right now, just as the cell phone technology allowed people um, in remote areas to have access to phones, solar technology can do the same and is doing the same. We are, um, you know, there are still lots of areas where people have to burn cow dung for fuel, which causes terrible pollution. But being able to put a solar panel on a hut can give them the light that they need to allow girls to study at night and to give them 
power for cooking. And so Pope Francis says, there can be no renewal of our relationship with nature without the renewal of humanity itself. So this is actually a great opportunity for us to lead through creation care. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today um, for the rest of the presentation. There is so much happening at every single level. I have to tell you that I am filled with hope and joy with all of the people, millions of people working to solve these problems and hundreds of thousands of people of faith. So it really, you know, I'm gonna give you a snapshot of different things that I know about that you, so you have the big picture and then you can start at your church. So we continue to do creation care during COVID. We were one of the only ministries at St. Paul's that could. These are a couple of my garden, um, excuse me, team at um, St. Paul's. We have something called the Mosaic Garden, which we built out of blocks. And then we had our um, different members come and mosaic them. So that's been a lot of fun. And up, I think we've, um, we have grown about 2000 pounds of organic produce that we have shared with the food bank that we support called Man on Meridian. And I think that creation care allows us to lead with joy, gratitude, and love for God's creation, especially his people. To have a ministry is something that is intergenerational. We have grandparents and grandkids in the garden. We celebrate God's earth and we bring people together through our common love of the earth and also our faith. You can retool the way you think about the environment. A lot of us, and me included, thought, oh, well, I recycle, I'm doing everything I need to do. Well, it turns out a lot of that stuff that we recycle isn't able to be used anyway. So we are trying to encourage reducing the amount of stuff that we use and refusing single use plastics, um, refurbishing, repairing, repurposing. A lot of that stuff isn't done anymore, but getting back to that is how we're going to be able to start to solve some of these problems with overconsumption. So starting a creation care ministry at your church, it's pretty simple and straightforward. We have a lot of tools available to you. And one of them is actually at the Florida United Methodist Church um, website where my task team has put together a whole toolkit. Really it's to form a green team, you meet with your faith leader and talk about goals, have an interest meeting, show a film, publish eco-friendly tips, and it goes on and on. You know, the more you do it, the more your church will be seen through the prism of creation care. St. Paul's is going on our fifth anniversary. Um, this creation care Sunday, which is, well, next a Sunday from today, we'll be celebrating our fifth anniversary. So I just want to share some of the activities that we do and just to give you some ideas, something that might spark your interest. So as you can see, this is an intergenerational activity. Our church is on Lake Ella. And so we have adopted the street and a few times a year we do lake cleanups. And it's a lot of fun. We open it to the community and the kids love it. It kind of becomes a uh, scavenger hunt. So we always weigh what we gathered at the end. And it's just been a really great way for us to connect with the lake. And you wouldn't believe the amount of straws we take out of that lake. It is not pretty. For racial justice, we find that creation care is a wonderful way to bring us together. Latricia's church, New Life, and St. Paul's partnered, and we got a grant for a project called Lighting the Way, where we had a big party where we shared creation care concepts, and then we went out for a hike, and it was so much fun. Our group got along wonderfully. We really formed some great friendships and then COVID hit. So we had to take some time off, but we have our paddling trip set for May 1st. So we're very excited. We're gonna paddle the Wasissa together. And this has really just brought our churches together in a supportive role. They just started their garden because 
they've been working with us with Tallahassee Green Faith Alliance. And so now we're supporting them with their new garden. So it really has been a wonderful partnership. There's a lot of ways to get your youth and your different groups in your church involved. We have a lot of sewers in our church. And so we came up with this idea to make reusable bags out of old t-shirts. So this was us meeting with um, the, uh, the student center, sorry, and some of our youth groups. And we were making t-shirt bags. And then these bags go to Man on Meridian and all of our produce goes into them to give to people, the clients that come to Man on Meridian. So it's teaching them about sustainability because we put a card in the bag that explains that this is a reusable bag and that it's upcycled from an old t-shirt. So we make about a hundred of these a month and we have a whole team that loves to make those. We also have a blessing of the animals in the fall. And this is our pastor, Candace Brooks. And it was a wonderful event. And that's my dog on the right, Maddie, where she was blessing Maddie. And it's just a really fun way to get your congregation involved with creation care. It also can save a lot of money. We focus on green events on the state level for the Florida United Methodist Church. And so we switched from foam and plastic for our Mothers of Preschoolers group to using our kitchen dishes and our creation care team volunteered to do the cleanup. So in four years, we saved 18,000 items from the landfill and over $800. And we're trying to do this church-wide. And Plastic and Foam Free FLUMC is encouraging all of our churches and the whole state to stop using foam and plastic because we love to get together, we love to eat, we love to have coffee, but we shouldn't be creating bags and bags of trash that's just gonna sit in the landfill for hundreds of years just because we had a coffee time. So there's other ways to do this that are so much better. I mentioned Creation Care Sunday. We usually do it, but well, we always do it near Earth Day. So that's gonna be next Sunday. And there's our pastor talking about the difference between plastic bottles and metal reusable bottles. And the song, the prayers, the worship, everything is related to creation care. And it's just a great way to bring the theology into the life of the church. You can make your green, your sanctuary a green sanctuary. And you know, you might be doing some of these things already, um, but recycling, composting, you, if you have to use disposables, use paper, change your bulbs to LEDs, get an energy audit, it's free. You know, the goal is to go solar and divest from fossil fuels, but you know, this is a process and you know, you can phase in these things. Uh, we haven't made it there yet, even after five years, but we have goals. This is our plastic monster and us at the Florida annual conference where we were talking to the entire state about taming the plastic monster. And we made this big monster out of plastic bags. And a lot of youth groups do these things together and it's a lot of fun. You can also make these mats out of plastic bags called Plarn. You make yarn out of plastic and there's crocheters that make these mats and then they give them to the homeless as sleeping mats. We put in a garden and Leon County is amazing. They give you a thousand dollars grant to start a garden. And it's really simple to do. You just get on their website and it's not only to start a garden. We also got a compost bin and some other things. So it might be worth you guys looking into. And it was a lot of fun. We had our whole congregation out there, um, the youth group, the kids, even our pastor's dog got into it. So it was great, a lot of fun. And then we got to show everybody how food grows. And I'll be honest, I didn't know either. I always had herbs and plants, but never really vegetables. So it was so much fun. And as you can see, we put this garden right in the middle of the church grounds. So people can walk by it and see it. It's beautiful, but it's also educational. And we've had so many of our members tell us that they started gardens at home because they've seen what we've done at church. And it was harvest time. So we harvested um, we had so much, we actually made ratatouille to take down to the homeless population at Lake Ella, as well as giving it to men on Meridian. We created a mission statement for our group, and that's always nice, just so you can keep yourself on target. We have quarterly meetings where we 
uh, you know, do our, bi our big thinking planning, and then we meet weekly in the garden, but, you know, you figure out what works for your church. Showing an environmental film is a great way to educate your community um, about some of the more complex or difficult issues and letting the film speak for itself. We had a movie night where we had an adult movie and the kids movie at the same time. We brought in pizza and popcorn and uh, sometimes we'll have a panel afterwards to talk about it. It's just really been a great way to communicate. And of course, we love to celebrate nature. We have a couple of teachers in our group. And so we do a ladybug jubilee in the garden where we order ladybugs from Amazon. So you can order anything on Amazon, you guys, including live ladybugs. So we get the kids in the garden and they help us release the ladybugs and then they eat the aphids and we get to teach about the life cycle of ladybugs. And it's just, it's a big fun celebration. And then you can also do things like butterflies. So one year we decided to do the Monarch Butterfly Jubilee and it was very similar, just different bug. And it was a great time. I was in there twice. We also did a blessing of the garden after we did it, um, after we finished it, which was great. We were out there and our pastor did a nice prayer over the garden and we're pretty sure that's why it grows so well. We wrote our own vacation Bible school. And so for a week, kids just got immersed in creation care and it was probably the best week of my life. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Oops, sorry, that got in there twice too. And then spreading the word. My background is communications. And so that is something that we found really helps amplify what we're doing. So many groups are doing this work, but they're not letting anybody know about it. So, you know, get it in your church newsletter, on your email blast, bulletin um, inserts, have a Facebook group. Um, that's been a great way for us to connect with others. And then you can even write articles um, for the local paper. And I noticed on your uh, national website. They have so much content for you to use for your newsletters and things like that. You wouldn't even have to, you wouldn't have to write it. You can just get it from there. So here's an example of our Facebook group. So that was all church-wide. That was a lot. So hopefully you're not overwhelmed, but I just wanted to give you some thoughts and ideas. Um, the other things you can do is um, we partnered with a group that feeds the homeless and we gleaned at a farm and got some sweet potatoes for them for the year. Uh, we're also very excited about Tallahassee Green Faith Alliance and our partnership with um, Tallahassee Food Network. We go to the Igro Garden every Monday for Divine Dirt, where we help them grow food for the community. And we also help other gardens get started and um, get renewed. So this was the Seminole Heights Garden, where we took it from completely overgrown to planted with collard greens in just a few hours. We welcome you all to join us at Tallahassee Green, Green Faith Alliance. We meet the second Thursday of each month and you can find us on Facebook if you'd like to join us there. It's a lot of fun. You can also get involved with uh, local movements like this one to move to renewable energy. And the city actually passed the resolution and now they are working towards coming up with a clean energy plan just because a group of advocates got together and said, this is what we want. And you could go to rallies, communicate with your commissioners, your representatives, even your members of Congress, because at the end of the day, they all know that this is what we need, but they need to know that we care so we could build political will for climate action. Okay, so these are some of the national leaders. I got to meet with them at the faith leaders um, meeting at COP25, and they told us point blank, they need to hear more from faith leaders about our desire for them to act. So that was a call that we need to heed. And being there internationally, I was at a rally with 500,000 people. Everyone, it feels like, is so ready for climate action, and they're just waiting for the U.S. to lead. So it really is imperative that we as people of faith let our leaders know that that's what we want. So here is your website page and this is where you can go to get all the resources that you need for creation care. 
So this is just a screenshot, but you can find it at episcopalchurch.org slash ministries slash creation dash care. So, you know, it's time for us to act. And part of that action is also praying, make praying for the earth, the creation, our leaders, part of your daily prayer practice. It's rejuvenating because it reminds us that this isn't all on us. We have God with us. And we know that if we have faith, but no acts, then that's just not enough. So pray and act. So now I would love to hear from you what green practices you already have in place. What ideas did you hear today that you're feeling called to explore? and where you might want to dive into creation care ministry. Thank you. <laughs> so let's hear it. What kind of questions can I answer? What, first of all, I'd love to hear the green activities that you all are already doing, because I'm sure there are some. I know you have a wonderful kitchen that is used. Um, so you probably don't have a lot of throwaways, I'm assuming. One of the things that we do internationally is to um, support uh, Presbyterian Church's Living Waters of the World, um, which provides clean drinking water in Cuba. Um, we've set up uh, three different cleaning systems in Cuba to make the water drinkable there. And um, we're seeing real benefits in the, in the uh, health, improvement of health of the people there. We also have a team that has helped other parishes uh, in the Episcopal Church to set up other uh, water treatment systems down there. So um, it's, um, there are opportunities at home as well as uh, abroad if we wanna pursue them. That's fantastic. We have a, a Cuba um, mission team and a Haiti mission team, but unfortunately right now we can't get there. We can't get money to them because of, I guess, COVID and all the issues with travel. So that's been really challenging trying to continue that work. So what do you guys think about starting a ministry at St. John's and kind of where where you would want to start is there an area that you've been thinking about like yeah that's something that we've been wanting to do that might be the place of action where people can start getting together and working on it any thoughts carol i have <laughs> a, I'm, I'm intentionally leaving an awkward silence so that others can step in um but one thought that I had was our cafe is a wonderful place we could begin in terms of everyone loves the lively cafe and perhaps the cafe could become that place where we put creation care to work. We've already made some moves to scale back um, on waste. Uh, in particular, we, we no longer use foam containers. We've used uh, to recyclable material and I think we could continue to refine that um, in particular with perhaps using silverware uh, rather than disposable um, knives, spoons, and forks. Um, the other thing that's, that strikes me is um, the Episcopal Church now is really encouraging parish gardens. In fact, they call them good news gardens, which I love. Um, and so somewhere on our campus, perhaps on what we're calling the East Campus. Think of the bookstore, parking lot, Marshall House, book lot, uh, parking lot, that whole area. There's a fair amount of, of area over there where we could have a garden at some point. So having a good news garden that could create produce for the community as well as for the Lively Cafe. And that could involve youth and children and all generations, as Kara said, that's pretty exciting. I think that could be uh, something that we, we do as well. Also, I love the idea of the Creation Care Sunday, and perhaps we could dovetail that with St. Francis' uh, Blessing of the Animals. We could, you know, have the liturgies that day emphasize the themes of environmental stewardship. So that's a few things to come to mind. Any, 
Any other ideas from members of St. John's? Besides the garden, I'd like to see us plant uh, trees that um, grapefruit, oranges, anything else, because they seem to thrive in this area and that, you know, people can come and pick and eat from. Absolutely. Love that. Yes. Food forests are big. We have two orange trees at St. Paul's right now, and I have big plans for about 10 more, but I have to let the trustees catch up with <laughs> what I want to do. We just got permission to put in a bunch of native plants, so I don't want to push it. But um, our navel orange tree is little, but it had about six or seven oranges. And as soon as they were ripe, they were gone. And that was a happy thing for me. I was like, yes, people are getting what they need. So that's a wonderful idea. And they do grow so well here. We are just amazed at how well um, and how low maintenance, you know, orange trees do. Um, and, you know, the other thing is, is I've seen people do raised beds on top of asphalt. So it's incredible you know, how <laughs> these, these wonderful plants, they'll just grow. They just want to thrive pretty much anywhere. So that would be, that, I love that idea. I think your, your church could really get behind something like that. Um, and the county gives those grants for $1,000. The work I've done all over the state, no other counties are doing that. When I tell them, well, why don't you just get your county grant? They're like, we don't have that. So we're very blessed to live in an area that puts a lot of emphasis on community gardens. This is Leslie Marlowe. I, I like, I'm glad Father Dave mentioned the idea of a garden. I like that idea of doing a garden that we help provide to the community for and also the trees that um, the other Leslie suggested. Um, I also had put in the chat that at my, um, I moved here from Reno, Nevada, and at my church there, we were also a downtown church, and we crocheted the sleeping mats for the homeless out of the plastic bags. I also personally make um, grocery bags. I call them bag of bags, grocery bags um, from plastic bags, and I would be more than happy to get something started with something like that if other people were interested in learning how to do both of those and creating those. That's fantastic. I wanted to mention, um, and I won't take real long, but for about 20 years, Rick and I have been planting native plants and everything along the edges of our yard. We, we have half an acre, it's a neighborhood, and we let a lot of things still grow. Those of you that have seen my pictures, I'm always putting on Facebook, look at the azaleas. But, um, but particularly butterfly plants and plants that encourage the animals. Um, and we even, the blackberry vines, when they get going, we tame them as far as we, you know, keep them in one spot, but the birds love them. And um, yesterday I planted four, four more uh, butterfly bushes and um, lantana and, and um, for myself, zinnias and um, uh, bush daisies. It's amazing in this little bit of a yard. And we have a tennis court that someone they put in before we moved in or I wouldn't have had that much concrete in the yard. But um, it is amazing what how many animals you end up getting and birds, you know, people say, I walked by your house, I couldn't believe the birds. Um, it, it's wonderful, I think it's church, I, I would love to help garden. I don't want to be in charge or organize it, but I love to garden. And, you know, we just use natural, um, we don't compost and we need to move to that, but we, we get a lot of the stuff that you need to put in there to make it real fertile. Um, it doesn't take a lot. The word spreads and the animals come. And the, I thought with the God moment, the one thing that <laughs> <laughs> happened a couple of weeks ago. It was, whoa. Um, we're in Clarn Lakes. We back up to one of those paths that's left natural. And behind that is Golden Eagle, where, the, of course, they back up to a plantation. Um, and I looked out and we had a Florida panther walking across our backyard between our azaleas that were, in, and he was inside the fence. And I just went, wow. You know, if you start thinking about what a panther could mean, natural and power and all of that. Um, and he left and um, I'm not recommending you encourage panthers and that we didn't encourage him, but um, 
it is truly amazing. And we love it. We love it. We sit out and listen to the birds and watch all, all the little animals. The panther was, you know, <laughs> as we say in our family, it gave me paws. Those are my <laughs> paws. <Yeah. laughs> we haven't seen it again, but they've had a couple other sightings. So, you know, Tallahassee, as you know, is just wonderful in nature. And you don't have to do a lot to help the earth thrive. It's, there's, you don't really, although I think the gardening and everything at church, I think that's a great idea and being able to feed people, especially with the homeless people that come through. That's a great idea to have something they can pick. But anyway. Wow. Catherine, thank you for sharing that. A panther. I was just at the Tallahassee Museum yesterday with my son looking at the panthers. Mm -hmm. Those are big animals. And that's really yeah. something that I mean, they're very rare now. So that's incredible. Yeah. And you're yeah. exactly right. I mean, I learned through this process that, you know, native plants are so important because that's what the native bugs will eat, which is what the native birds need, which supports the whole ecosystem. So that's why we're putting in um, native plants now at St. Paul's after five years. But, you know, and honestly, I'll tell you, we started our ministry with three people. It sounds like you already have a ministry just with the people who've raised your hands during this call. So that is super exciting. I love it. I absolutely love it. And Leslie talking about doing the Plarn, um, I have a whole box full of Plarn and crochet hooks and examples that one of my friends gave me to do as a demonstration. So I would love to put together some kind of, you know, time that we could meet and get, you know, have a, maybe a little event or something. It's harder to do it on Zoom, I will tell you, we tried. It's not the easiest to do on Zoom, but it's a really cool way to get people involved who like to sew, who like to crochet, maybe, you know, that want to do a little bit more. And this just reaches a whole different group than the gardening group per se, right? So there's really truly something for everyone in this ministry. Very exciting stuff. Let's Feel free see. to reach out to me or anything about helping with that. And I'd be more than happy to. Absolutely. Well, I think Dennis is your point person. So I am going to support Dennis in helping him, you know, become the creation care leader or co-leader or whatever, you know, structure you guys are going to do. I know we, our ministry is actually under our missions um, ministry. And so we're a part of missions and we started off they said, sure, you can be a ministry, but we're not going to give you any money. So that's how we got that grant from the county to get started. But now after five years, I think we get about $500 a year that's um, given to us in our pass-through account for our garden. And we also do fundraisers. We do the um, alternative Christmas market and creation care is actually very popular for that. We made about $700 at that last event. So there's ways to, you know, continue the ministry, but you don't have to start even with a budget. Um, you know, you can start with ideas and a lot of these things you can do for free. So it's just a really exciting time. Tara, we are so grateful for your time and your leadership in our community. Thank you so much for joining us today. And please join me, friends, in applauding Kara. Zoom applause, very warm. <laughs> and it's been fun. Fran, I've been watching you and you're just beaming with pride in your daughter. <laughs> and Phil, I see you back there too, buddy. Um, but uh, Kara, thanks for blessing us with your presence today. We look forward to staying in touch with you. Um, for those of you at St. John's, if you're more interested, stay in touch with Dennis. Dennis has put his email in the chat. So just check out the chat there. And um, there was a question that came in from Roger. Does anyone have an idea how solar panels hold up in hurricanes? Hmm. Probably at least as well as power lines. <laughs> <laughs> if not better. If not better. So, I know Roger, that we... I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Kara. Oh, I was going to say, we have quite a few churches that do have them. So we could ask our friends at First Presbyterian or, um, you know, there's quite a few others, but I haven't heard, at least with the hurricanes that we've been through since I've been doing this, that there's been any damage. Of course, it depends on the hurricane and 
the direct hit, right? But Michael was, you know, we've, we've had some pretty serious tree mm -hmm. damage here and um, they seem to make it through. I put my email in the chat. If anybody wants to reach out to me, I'm happy to uh, keep in touch, answer any questions. And also I would encourage you to, you know, come to our Tallahassee Green Faith Alliance meetings. If you'd like to connect with other people in the community who are doing this work, there's so much opportunity for, to us, for us to support we're directly where the need is in Frenchtown um, and other places where we are supporting the groups that have organized and are doing the work and we just show up to support them. So I really, um, it's been a great way to help the community and we have a lot of fun too. Karen, thanks again. And I, I can see that Kara has added her email into the chat as well. So stay in touch with Kara. I also encourage you to check out 350.org uh, a worldwide organization that's putting pressure on businesses to adopt environmentally uh, friendly postures. So take a look at that. That's a very, another important uh, advocacy group. Um, what I'd like to do is close with a prayer for the conservation and stewardship of natural resources. Let us pray. Almighty God, in giving us dominion over things on earth, you made us fellow workers in your creation. Give us wisdom and reverence so to use the resources of nature that no one may suffer from our abuse of them and that generations yet to come may continue to praise you for your bounty through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.